I, I can't promise that we're going to go into um, all of the details of all of the questions that you may have, but we are going to look at these five. Uh, question number one, what is the Antichrist like? And the first thing that I want us to notice is verse 36. I want you to notice the Antichrist does as he pleases. He does as he pleases. In other words, if it comes down to a choice between his word and God's word, there's only going to be one winner. He is going to elevate his word above God's word. Second thing to notice is that this Antichrist puts himself in God's place. Now that's closely connected to what we just saw, but notice in verse 36 we read, He will exalt and magnify himself above every God. In other words, he is going to claim prerogatives that only belong to God. He's going to exalt himself above every God. Third thing to notice is that the Antichrist uses worldly weapons. Notice verse 37. He will show no regard for the gods of his father or for the one desired by woman, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. And then notice verse 38. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his fathers. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. And at this point, you're probably thinking, well, who is the god of fortresses? You know how in the ancient world, you know, the Greeks, for example, they'd have the god of the sea, they'd have uh, the god of the sun, all sorts of different gods. Well, I think the most likely answer is that the god of fortresses is not actually a god at all. I think the context points us in that way. I think actually what we see here is that the Antichrist places an enormous emphasis on strength, on might, on worldly human influence. In other words, the weapons that the Antichrist uses are not going to be the weapons that the Church of Jesus Christ uses. His weapons are not going to be, you know, prayer or the word of God, the sword of the spirit. They're going to be worldly weapons. Not necessarily exactly the same weapons that Antiochus Epiphanes used, but since he's the prototype, it's going to be something along those lines. Worldly power, worldly influence. I think we can see as well in these verses, uh, there is both the carrot and the stick. Fortresses implies that he's going to use physical force, if necessary, to get what he wants. But notice verse 38. He will honour a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his fathers. He will honour with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. Um, also notice verse 39. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honour those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. In other words, if you're willing to get on board with the Antichrist, well, he'll treat you very well. He will reward you handsomely for your loyalty. He, he's happy to use the stick, but he's also happy to use the carrot. He's happy to splash the cash to get you on board. And again, that is a worldly weapon, isn't it? It's very, very different from the sorts of weapons that Jesus Christ tells us that we're to fight with as Christians. It's, it's a million miles away from the armor of God, isn't it? It's a worldly weapon. So this Antichrist does what he pleases, puts himself in God's place, uses worldly weapons. The fourth thing to notice is that he persecutes God's people. He persecutes God's 
people. We see in verse 40 that the Antichrist makes use of physical arms. We see in verse 41 that he invades the beautiful land. Now, now beautiful land is a term we've already seen in chapter 11. Do you remember we saw the beautiful land is a reference to the promised land? That's really God's way of saying that his people are going to suffer under persecution. A bit like when Antiochus Epiphanes was trying to crush the faith. And of course, we need to bear in mind that the promised land, the physical country of Israel in the Old Testament, they're pointing us forward, aren't they? They're pointing us forward to the New Testament and to the church of Jesus Christ. And so that means when we read here that this Antichrist is going to invade the beautiful land, that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to march an army into Jerusalem, like Antiochus Epiphanes. What it definitely does mean is he's going to lash out against the people of God. And I think that is emphasized in what we see next, verse 41. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. Maybe you're thinking, well, what's that all about? Edom, Moab, leaders of Ammon. Well, I think it's, it's pretty clear that we're not supposed to take these three nations literally. Uh, these three countries didn't actually exist, at least not as independent nations, in this period that we've been looking at through Daniel chapter 11 so far. And I think really it's symbolic. And what Christ is doing here is he's drawing a contrast. Um, you think of the Old Testament. Maybe you've come across these three different countries, Edom, Moab, the Ammonites, before. What do they all have in common? They're enemies of God's people, aren't they? They are pagans. They do not worship the one true God. And I think what Christ is showing us here is that the Antichrist is going to treat the people of God and the enemies of God's people in a very different way. The Antichrist is going to reserve his special anger for those who are faithful to the one true God. So what's the Antichrist like? Four things. He does as he pleases. He takes God's place. He uses worldly weapons and he persecutes God's people. Second question we want to ask. When is the Antichrist going to come? When's he going to come? And we see the answer in verse 40. At the time of the end. In other words, the end times. Now there is a loaded phrase, isn't it? The end times. I wonder what sort of thoughts, what sort of drama goes through your head as you think of the end times. Now, I think it's a bit of a dangerous term in some ways because it has certain connotations in our heads, doesn't it? And a lot of it actually from TV and movies and things like that. And so we need to realize what the Bible is actually saying when it speaks about the end times. And it's very important that we realize that when it comes to God's calendar, there are two dates which are far more important than any other. There's the first coming of Jesus when he went to the cross and rose from the dead. And there's the second coming of Jesus at the end of history. And really, everything between those dates, everything between the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ and Jesus coming back to earth again, everything between those dates is the end times. That's something that Peter makes clear in Acts chapter 2. 
he takes a prophecy from the book of Joel. It's a prophecy all about the last days. And he points out that the prophecy was fulfilled at Pentecost, which is 2,000 years ago from now. It's something that's actually even more clear in 1 John. Do you remember we read that passage, 1 John 2? It deals with the Antichrist. And in verse 18, we read John saying, Dear children, this is the last hour. You think, well, if it was the last hour 2,000 years ago, well, you can't really deny that surely we must be living in the end times, the last days, now. So when is this Antichrist going to come? Sometime between the resurrection of Christ and the return of Christ. Doesn't really narrow it down. I realise that. But that's kind of the point, isn't it? We're not supposed to think of the Antichrist as being some distant figure from far-flung future who we don't have to worry about. We have to be ready. We have to be vigilant. We have to be looking around and on our guard. When's the Antichrist going to come? Well, he could be here already, couldn't he? Third question, what's going to happen to the Antichrist? What's going to happen to the Antichrist? The simple answer is, it's all really very anticlimactic. You look at the end of this passage, and the passage is gearing up for this really, really dramatic final confrontation. Um, Verse 44, we've got all this intrigue, don't we? All this excitement, and you're starting to shift to the edge of your seat, but you don't quite get there, do you? Because suddenly we've got verse 45 and it's all over. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. The end, like a balloon deflating before your eyes. And that's surely deliberate, isn't it? It's a bit like how God dealt with all of the beasts back in Daniel chapter 7. It's an anticlimax. And God is showing us here that he is completely in control. He's not threatened by this Antichrist. He's not going to be overthrown by this Antichrist. He's in control. We see that, for example, in verse 36. He, that's the Antichrist, will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. For what has been determined must take place. Determined by who? determined by God. This Antichrist is only allowed to speak his blasphemies. He's only allowed to persecute God's people because God is on the throne and in his wisdom, God allows him to do this. But when we reach the second date on God's calendar, when we reach The day when it's all going to end. It doesn't matter how hard the Antichrist fights. It doesn't matter how many people he manages to persuade to join him. There's not a single tiny little thing he can do to stop the Lord Jesus from putting an end to all of his schemes. Nothing. What is going to happen to the Antichrist? He's going to be comprehensively beaten and his evil is going to be crushed. So what's the Antichrist like? When's the Antichrist going to come? What's going to happen to the Antichrist? Fourthly, the big question, who is the Antichrist? Who is the Antichrist? Well, what we want to do at this point is we want to take what we've already seen, these characteristics of the Antichrist, and we want to see if we can work it out. Now, 
Before we do, one thing to say, and we'll see more of this in our final question, even though there is one particular figure in view in this chapter, there are actually a lot of what we could call antichrists with a small A. And we need to be wary of them as well. But who is this figure? Well, I think we've got a big clue in verse 37. Verse 37, notice he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. And that phrase really brings to mind how the Jews in the Old Testament and Christians in the New Testament would have described the one true God. They would describe him as the God of our fathers. It's a relatively common phrase that you see in scripture. And taking that fact and also taking what we see, for example, in 1 John, I don't think we're looking for someone who comes from outside the church. We're looking for someone who is inside the church or at least is regarded as being inside the church. We're looking for someone, in other words, who takes the name of Christ upon himself, is regarded as a Christian. That's why in 1 John 2, John warns us that antichrists go out from the church. Second big clue is that way back in chapter 7, we looked, do you remember, at the little horn? Um, That's the first little horn, not the second little horn who we saw in chapter 8. And I believe that that little horn is the same person as is being described here. But do you remember that we saw that he arose out of the fourth beast? First beast being Babylon, second beast being Persia, third beast being Greece, fourth beast being Rome. So who fits the bill? Well, let's think about those four characteristics of the Antichrist. Um, Can we think of someone who has raised his own word over and above the word of God? Can we think of someone who claims the authority to make declarations that are to be considered infallible? Can we think of someone who elevates his word, his tradition, so it's on the same level as the word of God itself? Can we think of someone who teaches doctrines that can't be found in the Bible and yet demands that his followers accept them? Can we think of someone who has tried to stop God's word from being available because it's a threat to his authority? Can we think of someone who's maybe, for example, had Bible translators convicted of heresy? and had them burned at the stake. Is there a prominent figure from church history who has sprung up from within the church and he does as he pleases? What about the second characteristic? The Antichrist puts himself in God's place. Can we think of a figure who claims prerogatives that only belong to God? Can we think of a figure maybe who who speaks or claims to speak as the representative of Christ on earth? Or what about the third characteristic? He uses worldly weapons. Can we think of maybe a figure from church history who has used swords and armies and cash and politics to try and crush anybody who gets in his way? Can we think of a religious figure who has trusted in the God of fortresses? Maybe a figure who has directed crusades, for example, or inquisitions, or has tried to pit different rulers from history against each other. What about the fourth characteristic? The Antichrist persecutes God's people. 
Can we think of a figure in church history who murdered hundreds of missionaries who were sent out from Geneva to bring the gospel to Europe? Can we think of a figure from history who slaughtered tens of thousands of Huguenots in France? Can we think of a figure that had people tried for heresy and had them put to death simply because they wanted it to be possible for ordinary people, people like us, to read the word of God? Can we think of a figure who had Patrick Hamilton slowly roasted to death on the streets of St Andrews and George Wishart hanged in the same town just because they were teaching people about Jesus? Can we think of a figure who, as we saw in chapter 7, has a connection with the kingdom of Rome? I think we all know the answer to that, or at least you all know which direction I'm heading. Now, I realize we live on an island that has been ravaged over the years by sectarianism. And so I want you to believe me whenever I say that's not what I'm trying to do here this evening. In fact, if anything, I would rather avoid preaching on this passage because I know a lot of people, decent people, will get very, very offended by what I'm saying tonight. But we do need to realize that for hundreds of years, the church, by and large, has identified the Pope as the Antichrist. When I say the Pope, I don't mean our Pope, I don't mean Benedict, I don't mean Francis. I mean the papacy, the institution, the office of Pope. Now, I do know that not every Christian feels comfortable going that far. Some may have certain reservations. Some may think maybe there is another Antichrist to come. And yet, I think we do need to see that at the very least, the Pope does tick all of these boxes that God sets out. And even if he's not the Antichrist, even if he's not the or the climactic figure that we read about in Daniel, he is certainly an antichrist. He is certainly someone who puts himself in the place of Christ. He is certainly someone who has a long track record of setting himself against the people of Christ. Now, I'm not suggesting that we start shouting this from the rooftops, I'm not suggesting that we take a leaf out of Ian Paisley's book. I think there are kinder ways of showing the truth to our neighbours, to our colleagues, to our friends. But we do need to realise here, we're not simply speaking about a few slight differences in practice. It's far, far more serious than that. What is the Antichrist like? When will the Antichrist come? What's going to happen to the Antichrist? Who is the Antichrist? Fifthly, finally, why does the Antichrist matter? Why does the Antichrist matter? He matters because we need to be on our guard. Now it may not or sorry, it may be that we are not in great danger of buying into the various pronouncements that the Pope makes. But many people are, but working in the assumption that most of us are not, I want to take our application in a different direction. There are plenty of other things and other people that can take Christ's place. And I want us to be on our guard against those as well. One of the things about lockdown is that a lot of us have spent a lot more time on YouTube looking for preaching and that's a great thing it is a wonderful thing but you will find some very charismatic or preachers on YouTube they have lots and lots of followers and we have to be on our guard 
we have to, for example, be wary of anybody who expects you to just accept everything he says without any question. We always have to pay attention to what God says in his word. Uh, Whenever I preach or whenever Mark preaches, you must not take our word for it. You need to read your Bible for yourself. You need to ask questions as you read your Bible. Because there is no true minister, no faithful minister in a way, who's going to be worried when people bring genuine questions to him about what he's been preaching on and what God's word has to say. We need to watch out as well for things that take God's place. Because, you know, Satan couldn't care less if you give your allegiance to the Antichrist or if you give your allegiance to another religious leader or to another person or even just to another thing. As long as your first allegiance is not to God, Satan is happy. And so we need to guard our hearts. We need to keep watch over ourselves so that our hearts are not captured and so that God is not relegated to the margins. Think as well as that, we need to be wary of worldly weapons. God has given the church a mission. And he has also given us the tools that we need for that mission. He's given us the weapons. We're to have faith. We're to pray. We're to share the word of God. And if we put our trust in our gifts, in our abilities, if we put our trust in a very charismatic figure, for example, or a method or whatever it may be, we're behaving just like the Antichrist. We're falling into the same trap as those who walk in his ways. And that applies to the mission of the church. It applies to our personal growth as well. We have to be wary. But we should also be encouraged. This Antichrist is about the most formidable, most dangerous henchman that Satan can possibly deploy. And yet, just as Antiochus was destroyed, just as he didn't succeed in wiping out the one true faith, neither will the Antichrist. So be encouraged. Because the Lord Jesus wins. No one can possibly stop him from accomplishing his purposes for the world. This passage is difficult. And yet, the overall message of the book of Daniel is really rather simple, isn't it? Daniel tells us, take heart. Because if you're a Christian, you're on the winning side. Daniel tells us, the Lord Jesus, the true King of Kings, he wins, and so do his people. Well, if you're able, please stand as we pray.